A warm welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. Thanks for joining us on The World Today. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Here's what's coming up within the hour. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi eyes rare third term as vote counting underway in the world's largest election. Israeli military confirms the death of four more hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. Plus, Ukraine claims it hit missile system inside Russian territory using Western weapons. The world today starts now. It's been a busy day in India as early results in the nation's general elections show the incumbent Prime Minister Narendra Modi's party, the Bharatiya Janata Party, may fall short of an outright majority and be reliant on long-standing coalition allies to form a government. The BJP-led alliance, the NDA, is leading in 298 seats, about 70 seats more than the opposition India alliance. However, the lead is narrower than what the BJP predicted as it had hoped for at least 400 seats in the 543-seat lower house of parliament. Meanwhile, the India alliance is doing better than what exit polls suggested with 227 seats. Mr. Modi, who is aiming for a third consecutive term for himself and his BJP party, had claimed a historic victory in a short post on social media formerly known as Twitter, although final results are expected in the coming hours. Now, when a party or alliance with more than 275 seats, make up 272 seats in the 543-member parliament, can form the government. India held the world's biggest election in seven phases over a six-week period. Nearly one billion people were registered to vote. It's also new dawn in Haiti. A bit of gang violence as Gary Connell has been sworn in as the country's prime minister. He officially replaces interim prime minister Patrick Boisver. The 58-year-old had briefly served as Haiti's prime minister from 2011 to 2012. The inauguration ceremony took place at the prime minister's office in the capital, Port-au-Prince. The surge in violence erupted late February when former Prime Minister Ariel Henry travelled to Kenya to seal a deal for the African nation to lead a multinational security force. Criminal gangs united to oust him as Prime Minister. Monsieur Henry was prevented from returning to the country as the gangs attacked the international airport, forcing its closure. And more than 53,000 people have fled Haiti between March 8th and the 27th, escaping the surge in gang violence. The new prime minister, who shares executive power with the presidential council, now faces a monumental task, including reforming institutions and fighting against gang violence. However, the transitional Gov council, tasked with arranging presidential elections before early 2026, emphasized the need for credible, free and democratic elections. I want to bring in now national security law and foreign policy expert, Joanna LeBlanc. She joins us from Washington. Joanna, great to see you. And you have, you know, those really strong ties to Haiti. So you're about the best person that we can talk to about this. Let's talk about the new prime minister, Gary Connell, and what experience he's expected to bring into the unique situation that already exists in Haiti. Thank you so much for having me on Amarachi. It was a pleasure. Uh, Gary Conil um, is what you call a technocrat. Um, he has um, done the work. Um, he, um, his, pre his previous role, he was a um, United Nations um, development specialist. Um, and previously he worked for the UNCF, uh, where he was responsible for um, the Caribbean um, and Latin America. Uh, that is a total of, uh, of 36 uh, countries. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Um, Dr. Cornel understands um, Haiti very well. He understands the region. He understands the intricacies of Haitian politics. Um, and he also understands how to engage with the international community, which is something that's going to be incredibly important, right? Having a, a, a prime minister who already understands uh, the world, who already has the, uh, the relationships um, so that he can help push the country forward. Because the reality is that Haiti is in a dire position. Haiti is in a dire state. Uh, this is not a time uh, where people will be learning on the job. This is a time 
uh, when people need to be fully qualified and be able to um, hit the ground running from day one. And this is what I think um, Dr. Gabi Kunin um, has to offer the country um, in its dire state at this moment. You're, you're right, uh, Giovanna, when you say he does need to hit the ground running. He's also no novice to governance. He's a one-time prime minister himself. So he, he does, as you rightly said, have an understanding, a proper understanding of the situation in uh, Haiti. But how would you suggest that he pulls the government together? Because, you know, that's a real problem, isn't it? Having a government of semblance of power to be able to carry out change in Haiti. I think the key word here is consensus. Um, he will need to have consensus among uh, various political parties. And um, as you may know, uh, there are more than a hundred uh, political parties registered in the Republic of Haiti. Um, he's going to need consensus with um, uh, NGOs, um, the, the diaspora um, who uh, live in the United States, um, in Canada, in France and other parts of the world. Um, he's because, and, and why I say the diaspora is because uh, the diaspora sent more, actually last year, last year, the diaspora sent more than $4 billion to the country, uh, which is equivalent to about roughly 30% of the country's GDP. So making sure that there's consensus uh, from the diaspora is also as critically important. And also the religious sector, sectors in Haiti, you have uh, Christianity, you have the voodoo sector. Um, those sectors have to be included. Um, and also the, the youth, right? Um, so making sure everybody, everyone is able to come to the table to create a consensus government will be uh, paramount uh, for Dr. Kumi to be successful as the prime minister of, of Haiti. Would he also need the support of former prime ministers? I mean, he's replacing interim prime minister Patrick Boisver, who took over when Ariel Henry was deposed, so when he couldn't return to the country as prime minister. Well, Ariel Henry is the main reason why, you know, there seemed to be a takeover of power, uh, a seeming chaos in the country in the first place. So will he need, you know, the support from these groups of people, people who have been in power before? Um, should he include them in the new political makeup in Haiti? I think Dr. Cornel will certainly need the support of former Prime Minister Ariel Henry, who led the country for um, over a, a year after the assassination of President Jovenel Moy. Now, does Ariel Henry need to be part of this edge from government, which is only going to be installed for roughly two years? And the mandate of this government is to, one, help to facilitate uh, the multinational mission uh, that will come into the country, which will be led by the Republic of Kenya, and also to be able to organize free, fair, transparent, and inclusive elections um, that are supposed to take place in 2025 so that the nation could have a new president uh, by February 7th of 2026. Um, so I think in order for Dr. Gavi Kunin to be successful, he's certainly going to need um, the support of Dr. Ariel Henry. Now, does Dr. Ariel Henry need to be a part of this interim government? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, Dr. Ariel Henry was gravely unpopular in the country there had been numerous demonstrations all across the country um, and within the diaspora asking for him to step down because of his inability to govern the country effectively uh, and because of the lack of a legitimacy of his prime minister position in the country. Um, so but I think ultimately what's going to happen is that uh, uh, there will be negotiations between different political parties different interest groups um, and different foreign gov um, former government um, to ultimately decide who will be a part of this interim government in the Republic of IET. Yes, and, and I 
do hear you when you say the diaspora, and I know that uh, Haitians, uh, some of them like yourself, and I'm sure you're also in groups where, you know, discussions about, you know, what's going on back home is is rife. Um, the, the gang violence on the ground, um, the poverty that exists in Haiti, the political unrest, all of that must must be concerns uh, to Haitians who live outside the country. So when they look at a new entering a, a new prime minister taking over, what do they say are the main um, issues that they would like for him to address? You know, in his first uh, say few months in office. Well, obviously, security is a huge concern in the country. Uh, currently, you have more than. 300,000 Haitians living in the country who have been displaced because of gang violence. That is the reality. Countless people have been killed. Um, um, a, a number of individuals have been kidnapped by these gangs. Um, and these gangs have essentially taken over about 80% of Port-au-Prince, which makes it incredibly difficult uh, for the day-to-day -day movement of people in the country. So you're talking about um, things like going to school has become almost impossible in certain neighborhoods um, in, in Port-au-Prince, and that is unacceptable. So I think um, helping to address the insecurity crisis uh, from day one is a main priority for the country. Uh, but the reality is that Haiti is being faced with a multitude of crises simultaneously. You have, one, a humanitarian crisis, two, a governance issue, three, an insecurity crisis, and three, an economic crisis. And you're talking about a country where uh, roughly 60% of the population is unemployed, which is part of the reason why the gang groups are able to thrive in the country, uh, because the government uh, is not in a position to provide even some of the most basic necessities to the people of Haiti. So because of that power vacuum, um, gang members now have the ability to influence and to recruit um, young folks, uh, middle-aged folks, to be a part of these um, criminal enterprises that have created a great deal of chaos in the country. So I think um, the, the, the insecurity crisis uh, will be incredibly, is incredibly important for Dr. Guy to address. Um, and also um, having um, being able to organize free, fair, transparent, and inclusive elections in the country. And I think once you have those two things in, in place, um, then you can talk about the other aspects of, of the country. Um, so so that's, that, that's where some of the members of the diaspora stand as of today. Right. And I hear you talk about security a lot, um, Joanna. Kenya did offer its help. It was going to send in a... Um, a, a task force into uh, Haiti. How is that going? And should uh, the new prime minister consider this really seriously regarding concerning uh, what's going on on the ground? Certainly. I, I think that um, is, uh, we should applaud President Russo uh, for stepping up to the plate and wanting to assist the Republic of Haiti in um, reaching peace and security in the country. Uh, that's one. Uh, but we also have to look at uh, the reality. Uh, one thing is that the Republic of IAT does not manufacture weapons. Uh, and many of these weapons, according to uh, credible sources, such as the United States government, uh, most of these guns that are flooding the streets of Port-au-Prince are coming from states like Florida, Texas, and Georgia. Uh, so the United States has to do its part uh, in addressing uh, the illicit flow of weapons into the country. Um, that is important uh, because even if Kenya is, is able to lead a very successful mission, but if you don't address the gun, the illicit guns flowing into the country, uh, it will be quite difficult to truly address the insecurity crisis. And then you also have um, some of these gang members, um, gang groups um, that are funded by certain groups in the country. Uh, so those individuals should be sanctioned um, by Haiti's international partners um, to, to, to restrict their ability uh, to be able to finance um, some, some, of these, some of these gangs. But, but look, Amarachi, I just think that 
Kenny is positioned to help address um, the issue in Haiti. Um, it shows um, the unity, it shows Pan-Africanism, and I think it's consistent with what the United Nations, I'm sorry, what the African Union has been pushing uh, for the inclusion, for the integration, and, and, and for the African continent to work with people of African descent all over the world. And, and Haiti is considered to be part of, of the six region. Um, so, so and, and I think that if President Ruto works with the right partners on the ground, you could have a situation where um, before the deployment of police officers into the country, um, you can soften the ground and ultimately, you can have a situation where not even one bullet is shot up in the air. And the reason I say this, Amarachi, is because Haiti's insecurity crisis, unlike many um, um, gang groups or terrorist groups across the world, it is not driven by an ideology, right? It is driven primarily due to lack of political will. Um, it is driven due to lack of um, economic opportunity. Um, so if you're able to provide um, individuals those types of opportunities, um, you can really uh, be successful in addressing the insecurity crisis in the country. And Joanna, if you could just quickly talk about, you know, where the United States uh, should stand, you know, with Haiti at this time. Well, one of the things that I think is important is that the reason why the Kenyan-led mission um, may be seen as an unpopular mission by many in the diaspora uh, is because previous interventions in the country by the United States have failed. The United States occupied Haiti uh, for 20 years, starting in 1914. It was disastrous and then followed by the UN, uh, which came into the country after the disastrous 2010 earthquake that killed more than 300,000 Haitians and others in the country. Uh, that was also a, a disaster. That mission brought cholera into the country, which left thousands of, of Haitians dead, um, as well as um, left uh, countless Haitians sick. Um, so I think this is a very unique opportunity for not just the United States, but the international community to actually get this right. Uh, while there are immense challenges, I think there are also immense opportunities um, to, uh, to be a better partner to the Republic of IET, um, to be able to provide the necessary financial assistance that are needed in order for this multinational mission to be successful in addressing the insecurity crisis. Um, I know that the United States government has pledged um, some funds that will go towards this mission, but it's still not sufficient. Uh, as we know, Congress has the power of the purse, and we have a very fractured and dysfunctional Congress right now here in Washington, D.C. So it makes things a bit more complicated. Uh, but ultimately, I think it is a, a new day for the United States um, to rewrite its, its history as it relates to relations between the U.S. and the Republic of IET. Joanna, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for joining us on The World Today. Thank you, Amarachi. Our residents of Brussels have been expressing their thoughts ahead of the upcoming European Parliament elections set to take place this week. While some residents anticipate a surge in right-wing influence, others are concerned about the potential for Europe to become more polarized. They also emphasize the importance of young voters in the elections. The European Parliament elections are scheduled to take place from June 6th to 9th, marking the 10th national election since 1979 and the po first post-Brexit election. I believe they are very important because, uh, especially as young people, we can cast our votes. We can uh, we can say what we what we want to change if we want to change anything. And uh, yeah, we should appreciate that we have a vote. Um, I think the general public of Poland is um, maybe in the center, maybe it's switching towards the left wing, uh, especially young people because uh, we've seen the right wing. <laughs> And we want to see the left wing. I hope that especially young people are not going to be quite 
influence from the strong right or left hand parties and that in the end there will be a good compromise for a centered version so yeah not too much of populism and um, yeah so we can get a proper European Parliament like doing the right thing with smart things not populistic things well, I would be more happy if uh, the left goes up but I think that uh, many people are going to vote for the right so I hope uh, many uh, young people will vote for I think it's going to be more far right, uh, expecting, uh, yeah, but uh, I hope for another, uh, another result, yeah. It's a threat of uh, anti-European to be very, uh, very uh, enforced in this uh, new, uh, in this new parliament, so I hope there will not be too, have too much space for fighting against Europe. And it's very important that we uh, stick together. We stick together to find a solution, because all Europe is uh, concerned. But of, of course, the, the extreme going uh, up is, uh, reminds, of course, uh, dark times. So we hope it will not follow the same way and uh, yeah. learn from history. Staying in Europe, the tractors returned to the streets on Monday. Hundreds of Spanish farmers blocked major highways to protest the European Union's agricultural policies and cheap imports. And dozens of tractors were seen blocking traffic at the highway, some carrying signs reading, Without farming, we have no future. In recent months, farmers across Europe have engaged in tractor protests and blockades of major highways, with thousands of participating in countries like France, Germany, Belgium, Spain, Italy and Greece. A key issue is driving the protests include high production costs, tax hikes, excessive regulations, fuel costs, EU-wide green policies and cheap imports from countries like Ukraine after the EU lifted tariffs amid the conflict with Russia. Now we're in southern Asia where the death toll from deadly flooding and landslides in Sri Lanka has risen to 12. The disaster triggered by severe monsoon rains has led to significant disruptions including power outages in several regions. Schools have also been closed across the island as 20 out of 25 districts have been affected by the incident. Now, over the weekend, the severe weather trapped more than 19,000 individuals from over 5,000 families. Torrential rains exceeding 300 millimeters have triggered flash floods, uprooted trees, unleashed strong winds and lightning and caused landslides across the island. More than 4,000 homes have suffered partial damage, with 28 houses completely destroyed. Uh, the National Building Research Centre issued red notices for landslides in four districts. Authorities are bracing for continued adverse weather conditions. Further now, going further east now, two people have been injured following well, you're looking at the massive landslide in Keelong City in Taiwan. Several vehicles were damaged as the deluge of rocks fell, covering parts of a major road the moment the landslide hit. According to officials, emergency crew uh, were immediately deployed to the scene of the incident and the injured were hospitalized with minor injuries. Search and rescue operations have been carried out with 17 vehicles and 30 personnel working at the site. The fire department of Keelong indicated that at least nine vehicles were damaged, as well as some trapped under the landslide. Back in April, the country saw a deadly landslide triggered by a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. That disaster led to the death of at least nine people. We're staying in Asia, but away from the disaster, bilateral relations now. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin is in Cambodia for a one-day visit. It comes amid regional tensions with China. He arrived via a U.S. Air Force plane and was received by a delegation of Cambodian military officials. Mr. Austin's visit also comes after Cambodia signed an agreement with Beijing to develop a naval base on the coast of the Gulf of Thailand a waterway of strategic interests near the contested South China Sea. The U.S. Defense Chief met Cambodia's Prime Minister Hon Manet and Minister of National Defense Thich Sia. 
They discussed how the United States and Cambodia can strengthen their defense relations in support of regional peace and stability. International Atomic Energy Agency rarely issues warnings, but when it does, it's always related to a threat to nuclear proliferation. The agency's Director General Rafael Grossi has warned about Iran's technology and capacity to produce nuclear weapons, citing a possible shift in Tehran's nuclear doctrine. Mr. Grossi also warns and claims Iran has been enriching uranium at a very high level, adding many countries in the region indicated their intentions to get a nuclear weapon if Iran does so. Britain, France and Germany are also seeking to censure Iran over its lack of cooperation with the IAEA. Oh, that uh, Iran is considering a number of activities um, uh, which are not being... And you must remember that in the context of the law passed in 2021, there are a number of mandated activities which would require or that would imply construction of new facilities, uh, installing new cascades, having different, different things, uh, which in some cases would require, in our opinion, I mean, in the legal position, that is not more, it's more than an opinion. We are absolutely convinced that 3.1 cannot be unilaterally modified as they have, and they should be informing us of that. But we will cross that bridge when we get to it. So we, we, we know the capacities they have. They, they have the capacity, and this is proven, to produce the nuclear material. Hmm? And there were efforts, as the agency um, certified, Back in 2015, there were efforts in the context of a, a plan to go in that direction. But ever since, and I have been saying that, we don't have any information, hmm, verifiable information, that Iran has a nuclear weapon uh, program. It has a number of technologies, and it's and reaching uranium at a very high level, etc., etc. So this is why I have expressed concern when a country starts saying I have everything I need in case I decide to. So I don't think this is appropriate, um, and it's something um, I discussed in Tehran. Uh, on the one hand, when we say that we uh, have gaps which prevent us from having a, a I would say, uh, a, a complete uh, and clear view of the completeness and the correctness of Iran's uh, declarations. This is what is um, uh, prompting us to seek more uh, access, more information, more verification, without which it, that is not uh, that is not possible uh, at, at the moment. And this is why we are trying to uh, uh, have initiatives, present ideas, concrete technical ideas, to try to mitigate, hmm, at least in the first in instance, uh, these um, uh, uh, lagoons that we have uh, in, in, the, uh, in the information. Mm -hmm. So um, when you say how concerned, how much is much, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned. This is, this is a real thing. This is why uh, people all over the world are looking at this. This is why it's at the top of the international agenda for more than two decades. Uh, importantly, when I was in, uh, in, in Iran and discussing with the late uh, foreign minister, uh, he confirmed that Iran is uh, within the NPT, um, and uh, that there are no plans to, to do anything uh, different. Uh, but, of course, there are statements, and they will have an election. So everything is, 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 is maybe changing, and we are going to be attentive and looking and following day by day what is happening, what is happening there. Many countries have said that if, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, they will, they will do the same. I think we have heard it very clearly from many countries. So uh, I think we need to avoid... Um, a, an aggravation of the erosion of the non-proliferation regime. This is very important.
after the war in the Middle East. Now Israel's military claims it has established the deaths of four more people abducted by Hamas on October 7. According to the IDF, the four were killed while they were together during an Israeli operation in Khan Yunus in southern Gaza. The men have been identified as British-Israeli Nadav Popplewell, who's age 51, 79-year-old Chaim Perry, 80-year-old Yuram Metzger, and 85-year-old Amiram Cooper. Israeli authorities say Hamas militants still have their bodies. IDF spokesman Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari said intelligence gathered in recent weeks have led to the assessment. All four hostages were kidnapped from kibbutz near the Gaza Strip on October 7. Today we shared the devastating news with the families of 85-year-old Amiram Cooper, one of the founders of Kibbutz Niroz, 80-year-old Chaim Perry from Kibbutz Niroz, 8-year-old Yora Metzger from Kibbutz Niroz, and 51-year-old Israeli and British citizen Dulev Yehud from Kibbutz Nadav Popelwell from Kibbutz Nirim. That their loved ones were killed a few months ago during Hamas captivity in Gaza, and their bodies are still being held by Hamas. We assess that the four of them were killed while together in the area of Khan Yunis during our operation there against Hamas. The information we confirmed by the relevant bodies after assessing new intelligence that we gathered over the last few weeks. We also informed the family of Dolev Yehud, a paramedic who left his home on October 7th to save lives. He left his home to save lives. He left behind him his woman, his wife, pregnant, and his three children in the shelter. He left them to save lives, and he was murdered by Hamas, and we revealed the remains of the body. Our hearts go out to their families. We are sorry we couldn't save them in time. Each of these hostages has a story. Take Chaim Perry of blessed memory. Chaim was a peace activist. He believed, he fought for coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians. Chaim was a volunteer who used to transport sick children from Gaza to receive medical treatment in Israel. He was brutally kidnapped by Hamas on October 7th. Hamas is holding women, children, the sick and the elderly hostage in Gaza. We will keep on doing everything we need for their freedom, to bring them home. This is what any other decent country in the world will do. The U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller has said Hamas is the primary obstacle to, to an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Speaking to journalists in Washington, Mr. Miller emphasized that the three-phase ceasefire proposal brought by U.S. President Joe Biden requires prompt action from Hamas, highlighting there's been no response from the group. The world should know, the Palestinian people should know, that the only thing standing in the way of an immediate ceasefire today is Hamas. The proposal on the table is nearly identical to what Hamas said it would accept just a few weeks ago, and it is now time for them to act. Since the President's remarks on Friday, Secretary Blinken has been engaging in intense diplomacy with foreign counterparts to urge the completion of an agreement for a ceasefire in Gaza that would secure the release of hostages and set the stage for lasting peace. Over that time, the Secretary has spoken to the foreign ministers of Turkey, Egypt, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates, as well as Israeli Defense Minister Gallant and War Cabinet member Benny Gantz. In all of his calls, the Secretary has underscored the benefits of this proposal to both Israelis and Palestinians. In terms of where it stands, it was submitted to Hamas on Thursday night. We have yet to hear a response. We obviously saw the statement that they put out, uh, I think it was on Friday, but we haven't gotten a response back from them. Just a military campaign in itself 
while it will, without a doubt, continue to um, kill and capture members of Hamas, um, is also going to serve as a recruitment device for other potential Hamas members that will come and join and replenish the ranks. And so you have to have not just a military campaign, but a political path forward as well. The violence that we have seen in the West Bank is unacceptable. It must stop. Civilians are never legitimate targets of violence. They must be protected. Um, we urge Israel to do everything in its power to prevent these attacks in the first place, and when they're not prevented, to hold those responsible accountable. We urge them to work with the Palestinian Authority to that end. Only last week, the U.S. gave the green light to Ukraine to use Washington-supplied weapons to hit enemy targets in Russian territory. However, Ukraine has finally made a move. According to Kyiv, its forces successfully hit a Russian S-300 missile system using Western-supplied weapons inside Russia. Ukrainian government minister Irina Vereshuk who posted a picture purporting to show the strike on social media, was quoted as saying, it burns beautifully. It's a Russian S-300. U.S. President Joe Biden had given Ukraine permission to carry out limited strikes using U.S. weapons in Russian territory around Kharkiv after several European nations had removed restrictions on how the weapons can be used. Ukraine had for months pleaded with Washington to allow it to strike targets on Russian soil with U.S. weapons. As Moscow launched a brutal aerial and ground assault on Kharkiv, the permission granted by Washington was both groundbreaking and bold, but highly conditional, as Ukraine can only hit targets around Kharkiv. On the other hand, troops from Russia's central military district have begun summer combat trainings across the Volga, Urals and Siberia region. As part of the training, crews fired weapons at targets as assault units carried out drills to capture enemy strongholds. Among weapons used were the BM-21 Grad Multiple Launch Rocket System, MLRS for short, the D-30 Howitzer and 2B-11 Mortar. According to reports, the training included drills for artillery, missile, tank, motorized rifle and engineering units. The Defense Ministry said that soldiers are 95% ready as they hold trainings day and night. Practical exercises are also underway in several Russian regions. Away from the front line, the grandson of Nelson Mandela and member of South Africa's National Assembly, Nkosi Mandela, is confident his country's association with BRICS Plus Bloc, viewing it as an extension of the ongoing development of ties with Russia. During a news conference in Moscow, Mr. Mandela highlighted what he called Russia's significant role in supporting Pretoria and the broader African continent. He also called for the suspension of Israel at the International Olympic Committee. According to him, the IOC deems Russia be suspended over the war in Ukraine, so Israel should face a similar penalty. Africa. We pride ourselves through our liberation movements to have had that relationship with Russia. But also it continued through our transition period and to our new dispensation, uh, the uh, new democratic dispensation, where we have been able uh, to have a, a relationship forged through bilaterals. It was His Excellency uh, President Nelson Kholitlatla Mandela, my grandfather, who uh, uh, initiated these bilaterals between South Africa and Russia. But we are also proud now that uh, we also uh, are jointly belonging to the BRICS plus family of countries. And uh, in this regard, we are able to uh, forge uh, relations and pursue uh, areas of common interest. We were uh, totally taken aback as South Africans that uh, the IOC 
was able to uh, suspend and expel Russia from the Olympics over the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. We have registered to the IOC that uh, through the European Muslim Forum, which uh, I am part of uh, the Global Summit for Palestine Organizing Committee, that uh, this is not an isolated matter. If Russia has been uh, suspended and expelled from Olympics, then we call for the Zionist usurping entity to also be suspended and expelled from the Olympics, primarily because they have been uh, found by the International Court of Justice to be carrying out a genocide against the Palestinians. Thank you. There's also a war going on in Africa, in Sudan to be specific, where fighting, intense fighting that is, is going on as both warring parties battle for major cities in the country. In Khartoum, the capital, the Sudanese armed forces released drone footage showing what it says are the rapid support forces withdrawing from an area near the capital's Halfaya Bridge amid heavy fighting. According to the SAF, it lost seven soldiers during the offensive, while 28 others were injured. The RSF is yet to comment on the casualties it sustained in the skirmishes, but the group reports that it had repelled an enemy attempt to infiltrate the city of Bari. The RSF maintains control of the eastern side of the Halfaya Bridge, which connects the districts of Bari and on Durman, while the army controls the western side. Neither has attempted to capture the bridge since July of last year. More than 15,500 people have reportedly been killed in Sudan since the fight began between the SAF and the RSF, according to the United Nations. Now, the UN refugee chief, Filippo Grandi, is criticizing the UN Council the UN Security Council, which is charged with maintaining international peace and security for failing to use its voice to try to resolve conflicts around the world, from Gaza, Ukraine and Sudan to Congo, Myanmar and many other places. In a hard-hitting speech, Mr. Grande also accused unnamed countries of making, quote, short-sighted foreign policy decisions, which, according to him, are often founded on double standards. The number of people fleeing their homes because of war, violence and persecution has reached 114 million worldwide. Mr. Grandi says the number is increasing because nations have failed to tackle the cause and competence are refusing to comply with international law. Last year I called on you to use your voice, not your voices. But this council cacophony has meant that you have instead continued to preside over a broader cacophony of chaos around the world. It is too late for the tens of thousands already killed in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Sudan, in Congo, in Myanmar, and so many other places. But it is not too late to put your focus and energy on the crises and conflicts that remain unresolved so that they are not allowed to fester and explode again. It is not too late to step up help for the millions who have been forcibly displaced to return home voluntarily in safety and with dignity. It is not too late to try and save countless millions more from the scourge of war. Let me add my voice to those who have been urging you to pursue an immediate ceasefire, the release of hostages, and the full resumption of humanitarian aid. And most importantly, to spare no effort to resurrect a real peace process, the only way to ensure peace and security to Israelis and Palestinians. Rich countries are constantly worrying about what they call irregular movements. But in this and other situations, they are not doing enough to help people before they entrust themselves to human traffickers. The consequences are inevitable. So compliance with international humanitarian law, which of course is an obligation, also has an element of self-interest. 
Here in Nigeria, the Nigeria Labour Congress and the Trade Union Congress have suspended their strike for just five days. It was announced at the end of a joint extraordinary National Economic Council meeting by the two unions in Abuja. Labour had embarked on the strike after negotiations with the federal government on a new wage Minimum wage met a brick wall. The industrial action had paralyzed economic and government activities across the nation on Monday after a six hour meeting with the leadership of organized labor in Abuja. Monday night, the federal government expressed the commitment of President Bola Tinubu to raising the 60,000 naira offered as minimum wage. The tripartite meeting or committee resumed its meeting shortly after. Labour announced the suspension of the strike. And the Lagos State Government says 12,000 feminine products have been distributed to help girls manage their menstrual hygiene appropriately. The State Commissioner for Women Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, Cecilia Dada, made the comment at the 2024 World Menstrual Hygiene Day at Isheriolora in Lagos. She says Lagos State in southwest Nigeria will continue to empower women and girls by providing them tools and knowledge they need to manage their periods safely and confidently. <laughs> and finally, a six-year-old Republican's son uh, stole the limelight in the United States House of Representatives on Monday how did he do that, you may ask? I'll tell you. He probably was just being goofy as he made funny faces at the camera while his father, Republican lawmaker John Rose, spoke at the podium to denounce the politically driven conviction of former President Donald Trump. There he is, the mischievous fellow. Now, apparently the father told his six-year-old son to just wear a smile for the camera for his little brother back home. I guess he got a really a little bit more creative and then took matters into his hands off he goes let's watch this together this country of settling our political differences at the ballot box using the justice system to engage in a politically driven prosecution and now conviction of a major political party nominee running for president especially on the charges brought against Donald Trump, should gravely concern every member of this body as well as every American across our country, whether they be Republican or Democrat, for Donald Trump or against him. Regardless of one's opinion of the current Republican nominee, we'd be well served to remember the long and cherished tradition we have in this country of settling our political differences at the ballot box. For nearly two and a half centuries, our nation's elected leaders have properly resisted the temptation to oppose their political rivals through the weaponization of our justice system. Equal justice for all. And an overall trust in our justice system is fundamental to who we are as Americans. And those who would destroy that hard-earned trust just to score cheap political points should be held accountable. For those not convinced Donald Trump's prosecution was driven by nefarious politics rather than the law, consider that the DA who brought these charges actually campaigned on, quote, getting President Trump. Also consider that the entire basis for this verdict is the testimony of a convicted felon found guilty of perjury who also admittedly stole money from the Trump organization. The same witness has since celebrated the verdict, even saying the verdict is, quote, exactly what America needs right now, close quote, and, quote, I would like him to feel what I felt, quote, close quote. I guess he got his five minutes of fame all right to the end of his father's speech. Thanks for watching The World Today. I'm Amarachi Ubani.